is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to and hopefully watching the Mr. Media interview with Brad Phillips, a.k.a. Mr. Media Training, which you can read, who you can read, at MrMediaTraining.com. Okay, smart guy, two words, two words coming at you. Donald Trump, go. Oh, boy. Well, one of the interesting things that you're seeing with Donald Trump right now is that his popularity ratings are going way down, even with Republicans. So he is not a serious factor. I think his rise, though, really kind of speaks to something, and that is a combination of people who are not happy, Republicans who are not happy with their field of choices, but also that people are looking for someone authentic and different. They looked for it and flirted with it with Ross Perot. People on the left looked for it from Howard Dean. So there is this great hunger out there for somebody truly from the outside. Donald Trump, in the end, will almost surely not be the guy that gets the nomination. Mm. But, you know, it could be interesting. If he decides to run as an independent, I don't think he will. But if he did, that could siphon some votes away from Republican candidates and make it a whole lot easier for Obama to win re-election. I mean, my sense of the Republican Party is it's a a lot of people who, you know, want – who there are the loud, noisy people who want loud, noisy candidates who are like them, who, you know, may not be the, the sharpest knife in the drawer, the brightest bulb. You know, their elevator may not go all the way to the top. Pick your, pick your analogy. But um, the, the, the vast majority of Republicans who are not like that, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're moderate Republicans. They believe what they believe. They don't, they don't agree with the Democratic Party enough that they would wind up over there. They feel strongly about whether it be defense or uh, abortion or the federal budget. But they haven't found that person who is like them in terms of logic and believes the things they believe, but is not an extremist. And when they find that person, I think you you talked in the first segment about John McCain. I think a lot of them thought John McCain was that person four years ago. I think they were hoping that Trump was that person because he has the money and the wealth uh, and the media savvy to pull something off until he went way, way, uh, just way off track. Uh, and, you know, they're still hoping that person is out there. And he may be, or she may be. She may uh, be. You know, Mitt Romney uh, he, he was not in the debate last night. He will almost surely be a candidate. Mike Huckabee is still flirting with a potential run. Those are a couple of people that I think you might keep your eyes on. These are people. Plus, there could be a, a, an unexpected person getting in the race. Now, I know that Chris Christie, the governor of New Jersey, and Mar- uh, uh, Marco Rubio, the Florida senator, both of them have issued virtually what are known as Sherman-esque denials. If asked, I will not run. But if the party comes to them and says, we are in desperate trouble with the field of candidates we have, please, for the good of the country, do it, we might see somebody unexpected get in the race. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if, if the person who ultimately gets the nomination is somebody we're even talking about right now. You know, <clears throat> it seemed like their rising star for a few months was going to be uh, uh, Massachusetts Senator Scott Brown, but you never hear his name anymore. Yeah, Scott Brown has has made a very calculated choice in Massachusetts, uh, and that is to try to win re-election as a Republican. He he's the one who won Ted Kennedy's seat uh, in a state that typically votes Democratic. John Kerry is the other Massachusetts senator, uh, so he has really, I think, purposely diminished his role on the national stage just to try to focus on winning re-election as a Massachusetts senator. Hmm. Um, change the subject for a minute. Let's say that you've got a celebrity or a politician, someone well-recognized by most people, uh, who has delivered a truly embarrassing moment uh, in public, and he needs a big stage. He or she needs a big stage to apologize. And for the sake of argument, I'm going to present you with three opportunities to make amends. Uh, They could go on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno on NBC. They could go on Piers Morgan Tonight on CNN. uh, Or The Howard Stern Show on Sirius. Okay, which show is the right setting for different reasons? Sure, let's take them one. But I think the uh, the real answer to that question is it depends on the gaffe, who committed it, and the seriousness of it. If it is something that is not at such a, a huge uh, gaffe, something that really, let's say, uh, compromises somebody's ability to be a leader, 
then a comedy show might be the right way to do it. Uh, and it's interesting that you mentioned Jay Leno because I would much prefer putting a guest on his show than, say, John Stewart's show. John Stewart is a really tough interviewer, and in, in many ways I find him to be tougher than a lot of the so-called news anchors. I, given the choice between David Gregory on Meet the Press or John Stewart, I, I'd probably go on Meet the Press. John Stewart's very tough. Piers Morgan, there's not a lot uh, known about him. The person who occupied his chair before him, Larry King, he was a person that if you needed a softball interview, uh, he was the guy to go on. But of course, the thing that's deceptive with a softball interviewer is sometimes they lay a very uh, they lay a trap. They're such nice people. They are so obviously not out to get you that their sole purpose really is just to give you enough rope to hang yourself. Mm -hmm. And even in softball shows, you see that people uh, ultimately do. And the third choice you presented, Howard Stern. Uh, boy, if you are a high-profile politician in, a, in scandal, I, I would never put you on that program. But a celebrity in trouble, you might put on the show. It, it was impressive to watch his interaction with Charlie Sheen. Uh, it turns out that Howard Stern, this, this provocateur, has a very soft side. And when people are legitimately in trouble, he does seem to recognize that. And sure, he'll make jokes at their expense, but he actually is a pretty sympathetic interviewer who's not looking to exploit their lowest points. Yeah, that's why I asked you about that. It's a, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I, I could have thrown in... Uh... I don't know, Bill O'Reilly or uh, Rachel Maddow, but I, I mean, I wanted to take some places where, I mean, Leno was known, of course, for Hugh Grant years ago. He went on and explained him, himself with the, uh, the prostitute. Uh, Stern more recently had uh, David Arquette on talking about his marriage and then coming back and talking about his marriage some more. Um, uh, Piers, Piers Morgan, we don't know yet. Uh, he can be, it seems like he can be both sides of the coin. He can be the ultimate softball interview and the total suck up but then he can turn it right around and ask very tough questions and he's not afraid of, of putting himself on the line to try to get the information that he wants. So. Yeah and what's interesting about Piers Morgan the few times I've seen him so far is that his questions aren't uh, typically hardball but he asked such open-ended thoughtful questions at times. An example is he asked Oprah Winfrey how many times have you truly been in love? or properly been in love, I think is how he phrased it. And that took Oprah back. I don't think in her entire 25, 30, 35 year broadcasting career she's ever been asked that question. Sometimes the tough questions aren't the obviously tough ones. They're, they're questions that are open-ended uh, and thoughtful. And uh, of those three, curiously, Stern, I believe, has the biggest audience, which you didn't address in terms of, well, go here if you want to the biggest number of people. It's very different audiences is what we're talking about, I think. Absolutely. It depends. And, you know, Howard Stern, I think uh, people who don't follow the demographics of his show might kind of relegate that to the shock jock bin of, of young, uh, you know, 14-year-old male listeners. Well, sure, there are a lot of those. But I have to tell you, my group of 30, 40-year-old male friends, um, all of whom are professionals, all of them are college educated for the most part, they love his show. So his audience is much broader than people might assume it is, which means that in the right scandal, uh, it's the perfect show to go on. Hmm. Interesting. Um, all right, Brad, let's take a uh, – oh, well, one more question along that line. What about uh, this new entrant in media? I mean, the way we found about – the way a lot of people found out about the death of Osama bin Laden was Twitter. How do you feel about uh, the celebrity or the politician or the business leader using Twitter to make amends, to apologize, or to, to try to make their case? Well, one of the rules of thumb with social media is you want to apologize where the incident happened. So if somebody tweeted something offensive, and we've seen examples of that, a journalist, for example, named Nir Rosen, uh, tweeted something very offensive about the CBS correspondent Lara Logan after she was sexually assaulted in Egypt. Uh, so it's totally appropriate in that case to apologize on Twitter. Now, if the scandal leaves Twitter and goes to other uh, mediums, then you have to apologize there as well. But particularly if something is confined to a social network, uh, it's totally appropriate to apologize there. Hmm. Interesting. How has the, uh, the Internet changed the course of your career as a, a media guy? Well, it has really shortened 
the response time when a crisis happens. I mean, there's always been kind of a rule of thumb, especially in crisis communications, that when something goes wrong, you should communicate pretty quickly and establish yourself as the primary source of information. The idea being, if you're not communicating, somebody else is. And that third party communicating about you is almost always less sympathetic toward you than you would be if you were the primary source of information. But what Twitter has done is change the rules. And in some cases, you need to be responding in 10, 15, minutes or they're already turning to third parties to respond so the internet has changed the game in that the response time is faster than it's ever been before and that also means that you have to have people larger companies organizations politicians have to have people assigned to the role of monitoring what's being said about their brand on the social networks mm. and responding very quickly if things start gaining critical mass mm. one more internet question I think we're gonna have to wrap it up here uh, you had an incident. Uh, there's been a lot of been a lot of things online where uh, people do things and other people borrow their content. You told me a story, and it, it, it wasn't a private thing because it's been on it's been on your uh, on your blog. You had an incident with Mediaite where they uh, maybe took liberties with some of your material. Do you mind sharing that uh, briefly? What happened there? Sure. In December uh, of last year, I released a story called the Top 10 Media Disasters of 2010. Uh, I emailed the editor of Mediaite and asked if he would be interested in putting the story on his website. He agreed, and it was the big banner story on their website. About five or six hours later, I turned on, or I, I, I later learned, that he went on the Fox News channel on Shepard Smith's show, and uh, he presented the story and under the banner of Mediaite's top 10 disasters list of the year. Now, we have a disagreement here. I, I claim that I only gave them permission to put the story on their website. He claimed that once I gave the story to them, he could use it in any way that they wanted to, and uh, he could claim it as his own, I suppose. Uh, well, in the end, you know, I, I'm always reluctant to kind of go after his motives. Perhaps it really was a mistake, but the bottom line is I was right. And the evidence of that is that the Fox News Channel, a couple of days later, uh, did a 30-second on-air apology, re retracting the original source, Mediaite, and giving proper credit to my blog. But to your broader point, it, it is when you are someone putting out a lot of content online, there is always a risk. That's one kind of high-profile example. But there have been many smaller ones where I'll, I'll see that a website has lifted my content without a any attribution. And I think ultimately for all of us putting things out online, you have to choose your battles carefully and decide when you're going to pick a fight to kind of defend your copyright and trademark and, and when it just doesn't rise to the level. I mean, I, I feel that if I wanted to, I could almost make it a full-time job. And obviously, that's not where I want to be spending my time. So, you know, I'll fight the battles that matter. And, and unfortunately, uh, I think all of us who are putting content out have to let a few of the smaller ones go. Got it. I agree. We're, we're in very much the same boat there. Uh, well, folks, listen, you can, uh, you can read Brad Phillips' uh, uh, musings on uh, public relations, uh, media, uh, celebrity, and politics uh, at his blog, MrMediaTraining.com. Uh, and uh, do you want to direct people to a Twitter or Facebook, or do you want... Sure, I'll, I'll do all of that. If you go to my blog, you can uh, sign up for Twitter, uh, which is right there, or Facebook, or sign up for our monthly email newsletter with media training and public speaking tips. Uh, if you want to go straight to Twitter, it's at MrMediaTraining.com. It's very or clever. Or at MrMediaTraining. Very clever. Mr. Media Training. Hmm. Uh, Brad. <laughs> well, thank you, Bob, for, for the idea and for allowing me to pursue the Mr. Media Training handle. But as I've told you before, you're Mr. Media. You know much more than I do about the media at large, and I don't make any claims to know what you do. Uh, we have a good we have a good time communicating, Brad. I, I you know, we're we're good. We're very good. Uh, Brad Phillips, thank you so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, indeed. Thanks for having me, Bob. My pleasure. Uh, folks, uh, for more original interviews with uh, America's top social media, uh, public relations, and marketing experts, surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com.